What an interesting game. Not only is it Square's first major release on the PS2, but it's also their first attempt at a beat-em-up, and a 3D one at that. Which, as we all know, doesn't have the strongest track record during this time. So yeah, it seems up in the air on how this will turn out. But Square is a titan in the industry, so we should expect some quality stuff either way. Thing is, their catalog didn't consist of classic brawlers now does it? Well, they never made smups before either, but Einhander came out pretty damn amazing. So even though they don't have a history in this genre, I'm willing to give them a chance. Because who knows, they might surprise us. This is Combat Overview, here we go over the general controls, the main mechanics, who or what we use them on, and then seeing how it all comes together. And surprise us they did, because the controls are quite unique. So every face button has their own attack range. Triangle for high, square for mids, X for lows, and circle will do jump attacks. Pretty damn cool honestly. But to add even more moves with these few buttons, the game uses pressure sensitive inputs. So a light press will do a very quick, snappy attack, while harder presses will throw out slow, heavy hitting moves. And holding a direction on the left dubstick while attacking will also give us more options. Interesting concept, but I'm not 100% sold on this. I think it leads to inconsistencies, or better yet, damaged buttons. There is a reason why Street Fighter abandoned this mechanic after the first game. And Death by Degrees didn't exactly win me over with this either. Hey, I'm all for trying out unique or experimental control schemes when done well. So it all comes down to execution, but here in the bouncer, it's pretty meh. Well, good thing none of that matters because by holding out one, we get access to extra skills. This is where our unlocked moves go. But we do begin with a few by default. Now these don't have pressure variations, instead they're just consistent attacks. Not only that, but they are by far the best moves in the entire game. Across the board, every character has one or two default extra skills that completely solve the game. You can just toss these out without much pushback because enemies don't care to prevent this or require any real effort to take down. So yeah, you'll soon find out all these specific hitbox and pressure sense of attacks don't matter because this game quickly devolves into the simple mash best. Onto defenses, we have a guard that locks you in place, can't swivel either, and only stops attacks in front of you. Pretty basic stuff, but I never had to use this. And that's because enemies rarely fight back. And as you expect, it's actually better to spam instead. So best to leave this alone. Now I do wish we had some sort of a chemi or tech to break our fall. Because with this ragdoll physics, you'll be sent flying every which way, leaving you waiting on the floor. Which, yeah, kinda kills the pace of the fight. So it would've been great if we had some way to sort in these moments of downtime. But hey, just don't get hit, and be sure to mash your buttons first. Works like a charm. Looking at the HUD, these green bars on the top left is our stamina, but it's really our health. Game just uses that for some reason. So yeah, once you die, that's it. Back to the title screen to load your last save. Would have been neat if we could swap to our other party members as our backup, but now once the party leader is down, then it's over. Luckily the game is really easy and the levels are very brief, so the setback is barely noticeable. And speaking of those other guys, they fight alongside us pretty much the entire time. Pretty good partners for sure because they can actually take out a few enemies. Like I said, we can't swap between them during combat. But we can do something called Trinity Rush. So when you hear your nearby teammate taunt, quickly taunt back so you go into the cinematic team combo. Now as over the top as these look, they don't deal much damage. Because of that, it's really not worth going for when compared to what we can do solo. And oh yeah, this taunt doesn't do anything outside of activating that rush combo. So don't expect some Onimusha risk reward plays with this for aggroing nearby enemies. Now after each stage we're given XP or bouncer points to spend on upgrades. We can increase basic stats from life, power, and defense. Or we can buy some new moves. There's going to be a few options, so don't expect to unlock everything in your first run. Which is the usual thing we've come to expect. With this sort of upgrading system, it makes us go back in, test out these new moves, and figure out how to properly use them. Then we keep this up, just adding even more moves to our move list over time. The thing is, enemies don't require any strategy, and we can easily mash our one, maybe two attacks to beat the entire game hassle-free. 
So instead of buying moves, I just dumped everything into power and just completely decimated. I'm sure there's some hidden combo potential when you fully unlock every ability, but as I always say, longer move list doesn't automatically make a good action game. That's the enemy's job. Because hey, we can have all the options in the world, but it won't mean much when we're up against cannon fodder. When it comes to enemies, don't expect much, but a lot of mashing. So early on, we fight regular security cards. They don't really do much, but shuffle around. So use your one move and take them out with ease. We also fight ninjas, but they're just as weak to our spam. You think they would be extremely agile and be quick to avoid us, but nah, nothing like that. Watchdogs will show up alongside them too, and since they're on the shorter side, our attacks will just fly right over them. So be sure to use those low attacks. And yeah, everyone has their own sweeping extra skill that's easily spammable. We also take on these giant bots. You would think these would be the sturdy hyper armor enemies to punish reckless plays that every game has. Think of Ninja Saviors, for example. But no, we can easily spam and interrupt them just like every other enemy. Yeah, enemies are pretty bare bones and rarely present any ounce of challenge. They don't try to surround you or try to space out their attacks or try to punish your spam. They're all pretty basic and just stand around waiting for you to attack them. Then add the ragdog physics on top of that, which I do like on paper, because in theory we can sort of set up massive collision damage, so positioning and creative use of our crowd control options could have been amazing to pull off when earned. But this game is as complex as gang beasts or party animals, which is insane much. Yeah, it would have been great to have enemies that require us to use highs, lows, light, strong attacks for specific situations, but we have no reason to. And when your enemy design is this bad, then so is your combat system. Bosses are just as simple, because we can spam the same move we've been using this entire time. That's literally all we need. These boss fights don't require us to mix things up, or think about our positioning, or timing, or even what type of attack to toss out between our highs and lows. We just get in their face, knock them down, try to get behind them, and then let them have it again and again. This is all you do for every single boss, as every single character too. So don't expect to approach these enemies any differently, and form some varied strategies depending on who you play. No, that is not needed. Would have been cool, but they don't even bother to test us on specific mechanics, so I shouldn't be surprised how one note these are. Yeah, they're as poorly designed as every single enemy we fought before them. So just keep repeating the same attack, and you'll do more than fine. And that's the bouncer. It's definitely not Square's strongest outing, but it's fine, I guess. We did get Kingdom Hearts 1 and Final Fantasy X soon after. So luckily, bouncer wasn't a start of this downwards trend. But yeah, it's for sure not the most complex or engaging combat system around, not by a long shot. You gotta admit, this art direction is amazing. And that's all thanks to Tetsuya Nomura. So I'm happy to see more of a style from this era. But unlike Kingdom Hearts, there was no good gameplay to go along with it. Which is too bad, because there's a good bit of post-game content to dig into. We have three separate characters to play as, too bad their unique playstyles doesn't matter much. But if it did, it would have been fun to max them all out, and when combined with these short runs and NG+, we could quickly go back for one more playthrough. Which in my opinion, is a very hard ask when its combat system is this bland. But if you do decide to replay the game, you'll get entirely different scenarios, see new cutscenes, and get new endings. There's even a secret third phase on the final boss if you go through the game a third time. Was it worth it? Not really. But at least this will go towards unlocking new characters like the bosses, which actually have their own unique moveset. They can't be used in the story mode, unfortunately, but they're usable in the versus mode. Can also take on survival mode with all these characters. We only get this one health bar, no refills, and no power-ups to make it as far as you possibly can. I've read you unlock an alternate costume for Sion, but I don't want to play something that's on the same level as DMC2's Bloody Palace. So it has all the features we like to see in beat em ups, it could have led to amazing replay value, but I have no urge to stick around longer than have to. Yeah, it's a very flawed game that had a lot of ambition, but it fell flat on its face. So try it out if you want to experience an early 6 gen oddity, it's only 30 minutes long anyway, so it's not too bad for a single run, I suppose. 
But trust me, you won't be missing out on much either if you decide to skip it altogether.